country I pity the state And the mind of the man Thrives on hate It's the story of a lifetime, in some ways the only story. The fight for recognition, for dignity and fairness, the battle to define, assert indigenous rights, human rights. Namox and Medik, two high-ranking chiefs in the Wet'suwet'en hereditary system. Over the last five years, Coastal GasLink has been pushing to build a pipeline through the Wet'suwet'en territory in British Columbia. Today, the chiefs are back at the scene of what they call an invasion. It was so disheartening to see all this take place. But there's not a damn thing we can do about it, because that injunction that they had was, you know, give them the right to do that. But it, uh, was, did, we didn't give them any authority to be on our territory. In an era of reconciliation, with a history of Indigenous court wins in Canada, how did it come to this? police raid in 2020. Another raid the year before. Slato is the spokesperson at the Gidimden checkpoint. On January 7th, the first year of the raid that happened here at Gidimden checkpoint, um, the RCMP came. There was between 50 and 100 with lethal overwatch, um, attacks, attack dogs, sniper rifles, uh, militarized RCMP. And they raided the gate at, um, on the bridge at the checkpoint and 14 of us were arrested and removed from the territory. I remember at one point just feeling like I was going to throw up at the massive force. Um, there was a lot of emotions that were happening. Um, there was a lot of fear that was happening, but there was also this firm stance that I feel like everybody held. After the raid in 2019, hereditary chiefs demand coastal gasoline stop work due to the destruction of cultural sites. The UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination calls for Canada to do the same. CGL signed benefit agreements with 20 band councils along the route. The $6.2 billion coastal gas link pipeline will transport natural gas along a 670-kilometer route from northeastern BC to Kitimat for distribution to Asian markets. In the 1997 Delgamu case, Peter Grant argues the courts legitimized the hereditary system. And so it was not brought by a band council or a chief and council, it was brought by the hereditary chiefs. Now that's very significant today because no court, not even the trial judge, rejected that the hereditary chiefs would represent their houses and their clans and, and the nation. In January 2020, the hereditary chiefs flexed and tried to evict Coastal Gas Lake. And it's clearly acknowledged that yes, consent is required. So how does that fit with the economic force of a pipeline and those kinds of pressures on government? I, I wish that we could say, well, the battle is over. I think we've adv it's advanced on Indigenous rights and title, but the battle isn't over. Delgamu proved histories and laws were interrelated but failed to grant title, which meant the eviction could be nothing more than symbolic. At the end of the day, the elders in the Supreme Court saw the Supreme Court decision as a big victory, and it was. What happened? Well, what happened is, is that the government created a treaty process that was in a narrow framework. They were not open to what, what does this mean? Let's have a conversation about how we are going to implement your title and, and you have to prove each piece. The Nishka Tribal Council is on trial. Until 1951, the Indian Act prohibited status Indians from even hiring a lawyer. The Indians in British Columbia are not on trial. British justice is on trial. British justice is on trial. 
In the decades since, indigenous peoples in Canada have amassed more than 300 court victories. So many wins, but there is still a feeling of losing. thing is we're using the legal system, the Western legal system in a democracy, in a democratic this country, nation state, we're using it to advance the rights. Well, there should be nothing wrong with that, right? Of course, when that comes up against power and economics and the power to make the decisions, people start to resist, right? This is what blows me away about how they try to get away with things, the government, you know, like, like even like throwing this little tidbit about us not existing. It's, to me, it's more like, we have a word for it, it's called sukwink. Toying with you, you know. <laughs> Cliff Atlio Sr. We left off in part one. The new channel had decided to go to court. And after a decade, they won in 2009. Victory. First, the government said we didn't need much land because we were ocean going people. Then they took away our access to those ocean resources. Today, we are vindicated. Atlio now sees the dark side of this victory, comparing it to another fishing rights case, Marshall. The Marshall case? That case, even though it's viewed as a win, it's a racist decision. Why? Because it says, because you're Indian, you only deserve a modern livelihood. Ah! <laughs> What's the matter? Why, we're not equal? No, not in this country, we're not. A quick Marshall explainer. 1999, the highest court in the land affirmed the Mi'kmaq right to earn a living from resources, including lucrative fisheries like lobster. But the Supreme Court constrained that right with two words, moderate livelihood. What that looks like was left up to negotiations for Canada and the Mi'kmaq to hash it out. 21 years later, that still hasn't happened. In the wake of uncertainty, the Mi'kmaq went fishing and met racist violence. There's a couple of hundred non-natives out there. They've, got, they've talked the cops into forcibly letting them take my lobsters. Atlio can't help but see similarities. An affirmed right, limited. In the new Chonoth case, by the memoirs of a captive in 1805. It's a racist decision. Because a goddamn judge listens to the evidence that was provided by a slave of all things, of Chief McQuinn of Promoted who estimated there was a halibut bank nine miles offshore. Oh, we gotta listen to that. That's a white guy that knows, right? So they made this nine mile corridor. It's the only place we could fish according to that court decision. So what does a court win get you? We haven't got a whole lot. Uh, the government keeps trying to call uh, our fisheries for the last 11 years as um, demonstration fisheries <laughs> and they've given us very small quotas. Like Marshall and Delgamook, negotiations were advised and pretty much ignored. We try to sit down with them and they refuse to talk. The only, they don't even understand when litigation goes against them. They try to minimize their interpretation of what that right is. In the Yukon, it would take 20 years to negotiate. By the time there was a deal in 1993, Marilyn Jensen was full grown. When I put myself in the spectrum and, you know, kind of uh, juxtapose myself to stand beside my mom, definitely huge progress, you know, uh, from, from her day to, uh, to our day. 
you know, Yukon indigenous people own significant amounts of settlement territory here. You know, we have uh, as much legislative power as a province. Uh, we have like a very, very strong voice. They didn't have that. The Yukon deals were negotiated under the federal land claims policy deemed by many as too restrictive in scope. So I didn't really hear a lot of criticism, but I sure the heck did when I was at, uh, you know, doing my um, master's in indigenous governance in BC. But uh, at that point, you know, I was literally told, you guys don't have self-determination, you have self-administration. And uh, I was really challenged. I, I had to think about our journey as the people here in the Yukon. There was a lot of smart, very smart people, you know, uh, leaders who really grappled over these, this concept for many, many years, you know, of uh, do we have land claims? Do we take them to court? You know, there is no treaty here. How do we fix this? How do we, you know, establish rights for our people? The court's injunction, a powerful weapon for government and corporations. December 31st, 2019, the BC Supreme Court grants Coastal Gas Link an injunction. In granting the injunction, the judge wrote, there is no evidence before me of any Wet'suwet'en law or legal tradition that would allow blockades. And maybe most telling, the Aboriginal title claims of the Wet'suwet'en remain outstanding. February 3rd, chiefs ask for a judicial review of the project. February 6th, RCMP move in. You understand what I've explained to you. You're in breach of the court injunction. If you remain here, you will be arrested. 21 land defenders arrested. February 10th, RCMP arrest Unistoten matriarchs, including Frida Hewson. To watch that RCMP come toward us like a pile of ants, you know, that really really took things out of me. Our people that was on this side of the fence, all they were armed with was a feather, an eagle feather. That's all they had. They had no weapons, nothing. And all the RCMP with 200 RCMP with guns. They're not going to see the end of resistance to this pipeline, ever. Um, we've always said, and the hereditary chiefs have said it in our feast hall, and that's our law. Tayendanega Mohawks lock railroads in Ontario, sparking nationwide solidarity protests. Arrests are made at the Port of Vancouver and the Delta Port. The BC legislature is occupied by youth. After being arrested in 2019, Slato was pregnant during the second raid, showing support from down the road. The RCMP continue to be out here harassing us and surveilling us. They regularly drive up to my home where I have my children. Um, they regularly come by the camps, all the camps, and harass people and surveil people. The Wet'suwet'en were surveilled for years. This from a federal threat assessment in 2015. The faction is led by an Aboriginal extremist who rejects the authority of the Crown over his perception of what constitutes traditional territories. Eunice Stoughton's name also appears in Project Sitka, a 2014 RCMP intelligence report on suspected problematic Indigenous groups across the country. Indigenous people all over from coast to coast have seen what we're standing up for and they're trying to fight for their same rights and responsibilities to their territories. They've gained momentum, they've gained hope and inspiration from everything that happened in this past year. And so I think that we can see more of that. We've been supporting one another, we've been organizing together, and that's just going to grow and grow. past year, uh, 2020, 
couple of young guys who are actually employed by the company, I believe they were from the man camp out of the Burns Lake area, uh, they had come here in the middle of the night and they uh, burnt down the cabin that we had here. No one was home at the time. Two men were arrested. The Houston RCMP say they have identified who did it, but won't confirm arrests. This arson is a reminder of what happened when settlers arrived. But another way that they uh, got to inhabit our lands is if they could prove that there was nobody living there and no structures, they could actually claim that land as their own. So if our people were there, they'd simply burn down the cabin. And there were more flames in the chief's lifetime. There was an expansion of Smithers and there was an area they simply referred to as Indian Town. And uh, year by year, they simply burnt the people out. Namox was a victim of violence as a teenager. Good old boys knocked him out and lashed him to a hitch and drove, dragging him behind. He spent the winter recovering from his injuries, then headed to the coast to spend the next few decades as a fisherman. To avoid residential school, his grandmother moved the family off reserve to this neighborhood. His childhood stomping grounds. Up here in this area here, when I was growing up, we used to call it Super Valley because that's where we get our moose from. It's now the planned site for a massive open pit coal mine. This is just going to be one big hole in the ground and the creeks are gone. So the fight goes on. The fight is continuing. Right now we're standing in front of where they have the proposed pipeline laydown area. And to me it's just a propaganda material. You have to remember what happened with Enbridge. How far did they go? How much money did they invest in it before they failed? Back in Port Alberni, Cliff Atlio believes his people should be well on their way to rebuilding a fishing economy. He can't hide his frustration at a government that continues to drag its feet. We're down and out and they want to keep us there. And we're going to fight them every step of the way. He leans on the teachings of his father. My dad, uh, he said, Yeah, Powerful teaching, he said. You protect and hang on to the hereditary system because mankind didn't make that, he said. It was the creator that gifted us to look after land, resources, and people. It's always a close connection to my ancestors and my family, especially my mom and now my dad. They're both, this is their sacred resting place here in this territory, so... Just wanted to uh, sing a song for them. Way, 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 so this is like the earliest memory of my life, looking down this lake, Bennett Lake. You know, this is a huge part of my identity and my life. This is the essence of, you know, why our elders and our leaders and our parents fought so hard. So I wanted to sing this uh, Takluwedi song, which is my one of my clan songs, and it's a it's a cry song, but it's also a song about journey. Elijah first hired me, which is in 1975. Hello, self-government. Goodbye, Indian Affairs. <clears throat> Jensen created and leads the Dakaquan dancers. Revitalization, impossible without the guidance from her mother. She would tell us often, I want you, she always called us you kids. She'd say, I want you kids to remember, I was not allowed to sing my songs and now you are. So you protect that and you honor that. Yeah, so this is my mom's old house. And I can't imagine, like, nine kids in this house. She is now looking forward.
my little family and I plan on moving out here. So I want to be here. Yeah, it's really calling me now. I pity the country. I pity the state. This was 2020. What looked like the beginning of a revolution was put on pause by a pandemic. Land back movement and indigenous sovereignty movement is building. And all of that energy has been building up over the time that COVID has shut everything down. And at some point, that's going to be released. Others deal with the aftermath of standing up to a superior force two years in a row. Two of the people that were here are new parents. And so we, um, they're taking time to, just like I had to take time to, to you know, to have a baby and to, to start a, a family. They started a new family and um, the other people are still trying to recover from that experience. They pulled the palm. They're seeking to draw yep, me. I, I know. In this documentary, we shied away from the Wet'suwet'en internal conflict, but it must be said this pipeline offers real economic opportunity. As we see here, security at this man camp turns out to be a relative. In fact, another relative gave testimony at the injunction hearing that delays hurt his business. No, I know your family had to listen to the voice to recognize the man. But why do we have to constantly put a monetary value on everything? Don't our hearts, our souls, our rights, our title, our freedom, isn't that more important than a dollar bill? And why should a corporation or elected government have the right to remove that from anybody? I believe that the world has already been damaged enough. A year later, construction is underway. Please still arrest me. The economy rolled on. to test me. To the chiefs, the economy rolled over them. Yeah, that's just so disheartening, man. It actually makes me stronger. Yeah. They think we're just going to sit back on our heels and allow it to happen? No. They really don't know that what's open if that's what they think. Didn't freak me. Government is bumbling. Revolution's rumbling. To be ruled in impunity is tradition continuity. I pity the country, I pity the state, and the mind of a man who thrives on hate.